gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin to be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. May God add his blessings to the precious reading of his words today. Scripture text for today reminds us that they gathered in the temple courts and there brought questions of life. Now, the author of this Gospel of John wants us to know that they asked Jesus in order to trick him. But there are many places where Jesus comes as a man who has some spiritual presence in God, uh, who has some essence, it seems, a connection that might have the answers to the difficult questions of life. That's not uncommon for us in our faith journeys to have questions of life and to gather in God's house uh, to answer, or at least to seek the answers to questions. And so I always want to encourage you to wrestle with the questions, okay, in this particular situation, what does my faith have to say about this? Um, and so you have sent in some questions. Um, have you brought any questions to you today that we don't have that you would like us to address? Pastors gasp. <laughs> well, we have some that we want to address um, this morning. Um, some that we had last year that we didn't get a chance to get to, and so uh, the three of us are going to try and um, provide a little bit of light. If we don't get to all the questions, then so be it. Uh, we will continue to address these in various ways. One I'm not sure I answered last year came from this service. How does being a Christian play into one's political life with issues like abortion, gay marriage, and if being a Christian plays in a political belief, why isn't it preached more from the pulpit? Larry, do you want to handle that? Let, let me say this. Um, many of the issues we debate are issues in the ethical region where we can find scenarios for and against and arguments for and against and it would have just been easier if Jesus said okay now this is going to come up and here's how I want you to address that but what we do is we are inferring from scripture but for the first part of this question I'm going to say this I wouldn't say it's just in our political life. I would say it's in our entire life. We tend in America today to, to kind of slice up our life as in sections of a pie that make up the whole. Well, this is my work life. This is my family life. This is my personal life. This is my political life. This is my social life. This is my religious life. Friends, that's a new way of thinking. In the past, what you were is what you were in all aspects of that people knew, hopefully, at work that you were a Christian, right, by the way that you lived. And so I think our faith should instruct everything that we do in all ways. But we do, and we're addressing these today, because we do run into scenarios and situations that say, okay, tell me how to apply the scriptures in this way. You're asking me 
Scott, Larry, and others to interpret in a way the scriptures given light of certain situations. And I think that we may even err when we do so. That, you know, God hasn't revealed himself completely to us, and so we are, we are praying that God would fill us, inspire us with the answer, but in some ways we get in the way, if that makes sense. And so in each particular situation, it's impossible for us to say whether or not this is right, just, or wrong, or unjust. And one particular question that came up, I'll address first, and then I'll let uh, Scott and Larry talk, is <clears throat> around the question of what, does, what did the scriptures say about um, arming oneself for self-protection? And Jesus talks at the end of his life in the Gospel of Matthew about how, remember when I sent you out two by two, I told you not to take anything with you. No purse, no sandals, nothing. Just rely completely on God and God would do things. Now I'm telling you that you will need to arm yourself Right after he tells Peter that he will deny him three times. And the question is, is he saying that we should or should not arm ourselves? And is that kind of an indication for war or even strife and struggle? And I guess my answer to this question is looking at the picture and the stories of Scripture in the whole, God came that we might have life, right? The story of the scriptures is about the fall and about God's whole plan to bring us back and to draw us back into unity. And so I personally take the position that I believe it's God's will that we would never harm one another. We would never intentionally cause harm to another person. That in a reflection of the very nature of Christ, I don't find Jesus ever causing harm to anyone. And so I take the personal choice in my family life, in my political life, in life, to say that all forms of harm are wrong. That includes topics like abortion, capital punishment, the death penalty, and I would even say in war. Now, where that becomes a sticky and tricky situation for me in struggling with that is if an intruder came into my home and sought to harm my family and myself, would I take means to protect us? I would. That might result in the end of a life. Maybe not. But my intention here is not to cause harm, but to prevent further harm from going. And I think God examines our intentions much more than our actions. And I think we've adopted this even in our legal system. We call it premeditation in some cases when it comes. But you can ask Larry all that kind of stuff. Because <laughs> he knows a lot more about the criminal justice system than I do. But what is behind the motive is the real intention. And I think what Jesus is saying in that scripture in the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, that things are going to get tough. That a life lived as a Christian is going to annoy some people. And it should annoy some people. Our faith journey in such a way should set people off to a point where their conscience is raised. Where there's some self-examination and sometimes as we know that self-examination does not lead us in the most pleasant of places. But it's necessary for the transformation of our soul and of our lives to say where is it that I'm living inconsistent with the message of the gospel? And how is it I need to steer my life back Friends, that's not always easy personally. It's not easy organizationally or socially to do as well. And in many cases, that causes people to want to do as harm. Unfortunately, the good news is that if they succeed, I know where I'm going to be. Amen. Right? All right. Now, you've asked even tougher questions for Pastor Scott, so I don't want to give him a chance to get up share some of his thoughts on your questions. First question, why should Pastor Joe answer the tough questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a question for somebody out there from this service. 
And the question is, what are spiritual, spiritual disciplines? Why do we need them? Spiritual disciplines you may have heard about. And um, this is just another word for discipline is practice, right? So a spiritual discipline is anything we do to keep spiritually <coughs> fit and to grow up in Christ. So it means that uh, we have to practice uh, certain uh, certain behaviors, certain patterns that are not natural to us. And, and you know, what's natural to us is eating turkey till we pass out and doing nothing. But yeah, I've learned that myself. So spiritual disciplines would be things like, uh, and there's no set list, things like prayer, things like worship, um, pray, uh, intercessory prayer, praying for others, uh, fasting is a spiritual discipline, where you, it doesn't just mean food, where you decide that you're going to, you're going to uh, practice uh, self-restraint, or self-denial even, where you're not going to allow yourself to be mastered by anything. And that's what Jesus said we are to be. We are to be masters over our body. And there's a, there's a uh, scripture passage that this spiritual discipline seems to be based around. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And so that's a hard scripture. You know, it sounds like almost self-abuse, but it's not, it's not abuse at all. It's actually teaching our body and our minds to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. To seek good things, to seek uh, things that don't harm us, that don't put us on practices that bring us down or shoot ourselves in the foot. In other words, to grow up, to get more mature, to be transformed, which is our destiny as Christians. If we're not being transformed, if we're not being sanctified, then you have to wonder, was our conversion real in the first did we give ourselves away, or did we not, to Christ? And so spiritual disciplines are not meant to be uh, a legalistic sort of thing. In other words, um, you need to know that they, these things don't save us. We're not saved by these practices. We're, we, we engage in these practices because we've been given the gift of salvation and the power to actually change. And so spiritual disciplines is our cooperation with the Spirit working inside us. Where we, uh, where we, um, where we practice and again and again and again go over what it takes to be different from where we came from, and things aren't the same all the time. Right? We don't have to go back there. Okay, so spiritual disciplines are just a way to make sure that we are working out our salvation, as Paul told us to do. And I want to make it clear that again, these do not save us. And I like what Richard Foster wrote, who wrote a lot of books on prayer. He said, when I first started preaching spiritual disciplines, I read the works of the great leaders, St. Augustine, St. Martin Luther, John Wesley, Francis Asbury, St. Teresa, and I tried to imitate them. It was a miserable failure until I learned that God wants to work with me as an individual. Now I can read these spiritual giants and be helped by them, but I must not try to do everything the way they did. So if you're going to set disciplines in your life, make it practical and attainable, something that you can do, small steps, um, make it a challenge that it's not too easy, and then make it measurable so you can look back and do it with accountability. It's best to do it like with a prayer partner or a, a group, a small group, and say, this is my commitment. I'm going to do this in my life. Whatever it is, you know, smaller portions, um, I'm going to be more, I'm going to give more, I'm going to increase my tithe, um, I'm going to worship twice a week. Whatever you do, do that publicly, openly, so that you can be helped by being encouraged, and there's a, some accountability there. But those are the spiritual disciplines. Um, don't, you know, don't beat yourself over the head with them, but don't allow uh, the neglect of them to keep you stuck in one place.
Um, one of the uh, questions that came up officially, and then we've also had uh, as well as the subject of security. Um, and the question itself also asks, how do we balance security with hospitality and openness? Which is a tricky thing for a church. Our commission is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Part of that is being open. However, we do have the responsibility to uh, protect those of us that worship and those of us that are here and our kids. So because of that, one of the things that we need to do is just basically be aware of the situation. Uh, be aware that people are out there that want to do us harm without being so scared that we can't um, make disciples for Jesus Christ. Jesus did not sit in the uh, temple all day long and just preach from there. He went out into the streets. He went out to uh, pastor to the least of these. That's what he did. That's what we are called to do as well. So there is that balancing act. Um, we have had some discussions. There are some ongoing discussions that are going to take place with that. Uh, here in the next um, few weeks, I think, the uh, leadership team is going to be looking at some, some uh, security measures for securing the doors and that. But what I want you to uh, take away is that hospitality is key. We want people coming into our doors. We don't want to treat them as a, a, a foe or anything like that. We want to treat them as a stranger that is coming in as a guest. And we need to be hospitable to them. We need to welcome them. We need to say, we're glad you're here. We just need to be aware, mostly of, you know, that, that bad things do happen. But we need to be secure in Christ that he will be there with us. Um, as I was sitting here, the, uh, the, the story of um, getting out of the boat. You know, it wasn't as though he didn't know that he would sink and drown. He kept his eyes on Christ. And keeping his eyes on Christ is what allowed him to walk on the water. That's what we need to do. We need to be aware of the situation, but we need to keep our eyes on Christ and uh, be hospitable in making disciples for him. And I thought you were going to pick the Trinity question. <laughs> One of the questions that we got this week is, please explain the Trinity to us. Why is the Trinity made up of God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus? Um, but it is all one uh, person in God. Is it really one, or is it three separate people? Um, first of all, our interpretation of this um, is grounded in Scripture. This isn't like early church uh, fathers that come together to determine whether or not we are monotheistic, um, worshiping one God, or tritheistic, worshiping three gods. Um, and it's not something that was invented in the New Testament. First and foremost, all three are present, right? They're present in the Old Testament, they're present in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus, or no, um, the scripture started in Genesis. It says, let us make man, or I would add humanity, in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, and over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. I hope you notice the pronoun shift. <laughs> Let us make humanity in our image. And then in God's image. So there's a sense here that God is not talking about, uh, let's make man in the form of angels. Or he wasn't just speaking about us as the heavenly realms at the time. Uh, because God creates the heavens and the earth in the subsequent text. <coughs> so there is this essence of unity and separateness. Um, the spirit hovers over the water, right? The father speaks and creation occurs. And so the early church would kind of wrestle and struggle with this question of Jesus. Is Jesus really God? I mean, after all, we know Mary, she gave birth to him according to what you guys are telling us. Doesn't that mean that he was created and the Gospel of John wants us to know uh, right from the beginning that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word was with God. There is separateness and unity in that situation. 
Um, and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. It's as if Jesus is already there and the whole world came into existence through Him. And so the church has taken this position that there are three persons. The first person of the Trinity we call the Father, the second Jesus, and the third the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, whatever term you want to use there. But they are one. They are of the same essence. And what that means is they are made up of the same thing. Three persons, one essence. And so we worship the one essence. And there was a question that came up last year about prayer. If I pray to Jesus more than I pray to the Holy Spirit and to God, is that kind of disrespectful to the Trinity? No. Because even in moments, as Paul tells us, when we're finding it difficult to even find words, the Holy Spirit is kind of translating our heart into um, the words uh, that we can't even find within ourselves. Now, the scriptures do refer to all three as divine, and actually the creeds that we read refer to this. So, the scripture is not talking about different things. Of course, the Bible calls um, the Father, he's there in Jesus' um, baptism. Uh, as I referred to, the Bible talks to Jesus as the Word. Logos is the form in the Greek. And the third person of the scriptures is called uh, it's the Holy Spirit, is referred to by Peter even when um, Ananias and his wife lie about whether or not they gave the full amount of selling their property. And Peter says to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. And so there is an indication that within the church and uh, within us that there are three separate, but one essence. And the way, probably the best description that I've seen in this, I've heard uh, the description that the Trinity is compared to water. That water can be ice, it can be water, and it can be steam, but it can't be all three at the same time. So I can throw out that one. That the essence of the Spirit is this unity in being one, just like an egg, where there's a shell, a yolk, and a white. You take any part of that out of the equation and it stops being an egg. Just like if you take any one of the persons out of the Trinity, they cease to be God. And so the debate in the church is who came first? And there is a theological belief that God can't create something that is equal in authority and power and in existence to God's self. And so they existed always. And that the creation brings about the constructs that we know of a three-dimensional material world that follows a timeline of days and seasons and years as a result for us to think, but God lives outside of the constructs of all of that. If God existed in the formless void, uh, we'll have the youth come up and paint a formless void for us later on so that that's clear for you. <laughs> but we believe um, in the existence of one God in three persons. And the theological terms we use is one essence, three persons. That, I'm sure that clears it up for you. And if you want to have further conversations, our resident seminarian will be out here at the coffee hour ready to handle that for you. There are more questions that we have time to answer today. We'll find a format uh, in order to address those questions for you. I want to call the praise band forward this morning. Uh, to continue our hearts, our acts of worship, but I want to encourage you. In my life and faith, it seems like the more I answer one question, the more questions open up. That's just a part of the exploration of digging deeper and deeper and trying to apply this life of faith in a practical way in the world. And I encourage us all to continue to have that conversation around the same table with each other. It's okay if we don't see things in the same way. That's the Holy Spirit messing with us. But it also gives us, in our human minds, a way to understand the broader, the greater God in much deeper and, and um, more fulfilling ways. And so I encourage you to grow in your faith, to grow in your questions, and to continue to bring them to the table um, each and every day.